Everyone wants to feel safe in the dark. Closer. Everyone wants to feel safe in the dark. Let me turn that up. Forces unseen pulling strings in your heart. Everyone wants to feel safe in the dark. Hi, I'm Grimwit from blah 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 Naptian News. Yeah, it's late. Yes, I have an excuse. No, you don't care to hear it. Suffice to say, I don't sleep anymore. The Natch Evil webcomic is closing down. I'm ending it. Don't think I didn't cry over the decision, either. Statistically speaking, there's a 19 out of 20 chance you haven't read it anyway. If you have, I'm sorry. Time's up. That's all. The new up-and-coming Let's Play is Eldritch. Epic thanks goes to Loki for sending me that game, and like eight others. I've been looking forward to Eldritch, though, for quite a while, so I'm dedicating this Let's Play to her. Month is back for Whirlsend. He flat out said he wanted to do the last two Whirlsend episodes, so he will. Which leads me to very important the last episode of World Sin Season 1 will be on December 16th, not next week. Also, if you've done a guest voice for World Sin before, meet me at the graveyard. You know the thread. Now let's dig into this penultimate episode, shall we? Whirlsend Gate, Episode 17, and Sandwiches Saved the Day, by Mike Rojas. Special Guest Voice, Month, with Evil Seedlet. June, 1851, Some Woods in Montana. It was a nasty cracking noise, the explosion still ringing in Matthew's ears, that began his nightmare. The world was shut out as if behind muddled obsidian. It was a ringing silence. Matthew saw nothing past the body in front of him, and could not think outside himself. He fell to his knees, hands clasping his head, in order to keep its structure from fragmenting. Hot tears streamed down the man's face. They were rivers of salty ocean regret that burned the old lines down to his jaw. His hand reached out and touched the soft gray fur on the body. It was a mistake. It was wrong. It was a sundered world. What now? What could he tell his family? With a shaky grip on his hatchet, he positioned one of the body's limbs and raised the blade up high. He would hide the evidence from them, and then he would run, run so far away from the broken world around him where the sting of quiet burned behind his eyes. No other person would ever discover his secret, but little did he realize a town is not a person. October, 1921. Faustina Street. It wasn't hard to figure out, said John Davis smugly as he tugged the strap of a rifle on his back. It was wrapped in a black cotton shroud. Have you seen the inside of Nocturna? No. Trevor Clever was only half listening while the two walked down Faustina Street. He was too busy picking off the dead leaves that blew onto his perfect white suit. We should get something to it after this. The job first, Trevor. Anyway, Nocturna is filled with paintings of hunts, hunters, game. You get the idea. John took a swig from his flask before continuing. Oh yeah, it didn't take long to figure out the wolf was just a mistake come back to haunt the manor. That's why we got this thing. His thumb indicated the rifle. Huh. Is this uh, the place? Trevor asked, pointing to the building before them. This is the place. John, this is the clinic. Yep. One might have seen the gears cranking behind Trevor's eyes before he asked. Do you think they have food in there? The house they stood in front of was just that, a simple blue house. Everyone ended up at the clinic at some point during their stay in Whirlson Gate so everyone knew it was just home to Sutton and his daughter. Sutton was the closest thing to the town doctor, 
and it was he who answered the door after John knocked. The man was very tall, very black, with a thin fuzz of hair to protect his head from the autumn winds, and a huge grin that he liked to show off at every opportunity. Jonathan, how are you? Hey Sutton, did a little girl with a hatchet drop by? John asked. Sutton's eyes switched between Trevor and the rifle in John's back. He dropped the grin. The good doctor then stood up to make himself bigger, and blocked the doorway before speaking. Yes? Can we see her? Sutton's eyes narrowed. Leave the gun. Come on, Sutton. She's one of the children. We're here to... I know. Leave the gun or beat it. Trevor leaned on the doorframe and talked. Sutton, you could just send out the girl. This doesn't have to get messy. Sutton twisted his frown, then calmly shut the door. Trevor and John heard the deadbolt slide into place. Oh, well done, Trevor, John praised. Trevor waved the idea away. Oh, fooey. We have the gun. Just shoot her through the windows. Not long after Trevor spoke, Sutton began drawing all the curtains closed. John rolled his eyes. A little louder next time. He let loose a sigh. It wasn't the first time this girl had evaded John's bullet. Well, now what? John and Trevor rubbed their hands together in the cold night. A gibbous moon barely lit the clinic, but allowed the two men to watch the front and back doors simultaneously. John took a swig from his flask before leaning back in the tree, and Trevor squinted at his pocket watch. Last. I can't see. How long do you think it's been? Been about a couple hours, said a young girl's voice behind the two. Trevor spun around, pulling out his cleaver, while John, less impressively, slipped and fell in surprise. It was Sutton's daughter, carrying two plates of sandwiches in one hand. She was easily thirteen, with her shiny black hair and braids. Also, her left hand was missing at the wrist, and no one knew why. But then, no one ever asked. Oh, you boys. Here. Dad reckon y'all needed something to eat. While Trevor immediately started on the sandwiches, John asked, Just how long have you been there? If you were trying to hide, y'all shouldn't have been wearing white on a black night, said the girl. All eyes turned to Trevor, who took a moment to swallow and say, A man has to look his best for the ladies, you know. It don't matter none anyway. The girl shrugged. She already left. John smirked. Young lady, we've kept a sharp eye on you all night. I think we'd notice if the girl hid her smile behind her stump. Yeah, but what about the window on the other side? John's voice froze in his throat. Why are you trying to kill that child, anyhow? Trevor was working on the second plate. As John reached for a sandwich, Trevor slapped his hand away. It's business, John said. I was hired to kill a monster. Ah. Trevor said between chews. This is something about greed, then. Oh, not you too. Must be a lot of money involved. Trevor finished by shoving another sandwich in his mouth. I don't need money. It's worth my time, that's all. The daughter took the plates away before an indignant Trevor could finish eating. She's just a little girl, Mr. Davis, she said. So are the monsters that haunt Big Jim. What's your point? The point is, this monster won't try to hurt no one. But she has hurt someone. Whose child do you think that is? The girl was about to say something, but John cut her off. Matthew Cazador, the man who built Nocturna. It was her purpose as one of the children to murder him so long ago, and she did. Bah, Trevor said, checking his soup for crumbs. You talk as if this was justice, but you just said it was just a job. Show some consistency. And... Sutton's daughter added. Haven't worked for my dad and such. I can tell you no one's been hurt by this child. So if she's not dangerous, what's the point of killing her? I... well... Uh, John scratched his head. He pulled the rifle from his shoulder. Look, do you know how much it cost me to enchant this gun? Then he stuck a thumb at his friend in a white suit. Not to mention what I have to pay Trevor here. That's no longer a problem, Trevor said. I just wanted something to eat. C paid me in food, which I guess means I'm working for her. Trevor grinned evilly at the little black girl. Now, want me to escort this gentleman from your property, miss? Nah. Sutton's daughter said. The girl ain't here no more, so you boys do whatever. 
Mr. Davis, seems like you're the only one who wants this girl dead. John scoffed. It's just gonna get hotter now. So Trevor followed the little black girl back into her house, asking for more sandwiches. Are there any more of those delicious sandwiches, miss? He wasn't surprised to find the wolf was still inside eating her own meal. Outside, John rubbed his eyes and took another look at the rifle. How much time have I lost on this stupid hunt? He asked himself. After a long stare, he slung the rifle back over his shoulder and scooped back to his bookshop. He wouldn't get a chance to use the damn gun, until the winter solstice anyway. If you like Wilson Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly do if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will. <laughs> oh God! I'm sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't keep a straight face. Super thanks goes to Evil Seedlet for her voice work. If you like Seedlet's voice, go to her YouTube channel. Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Seedlets and Incompetech links can be found in the description below. Or to the side. Whatever. This episode's noun was The Clinic. The last episode's noun will be Winter Solstice. Have nothing but fun, YouTubes. Have nothing but fun. No, John, we could always try to hypnotize him. I think I seem to recall a certain ancient method. Try to keep his eyes open. Oogie. Now this is the part where he has to say Oogie. John. <sighs> Saturn was supposed to get hypnotized, not you. A shaky grip clasped. Clasped. Fuck, I cannot say this word. Uh, another word for clasp. Um. Change the whole structure of the goddamn deal with. There we go. Try that again.